Okay. So, so my point there with, with QM is I do not have this committed to any kind of intuitionalism. I'm just saying that I've identified that I think part of the problem is that we don't understand cause and effect. We have an old idea of cause and effect that's very strongly ingrained. So I think that's interfering with us understanding uh, quantum mechanics in an intuitive sense. And I'm also saying that we have a little bit of a handle on for people like Feynman who understand they don't understand, but they've gone in a direction of understanding it in some little level some little part and in some way that then when they practice that understanding it, it yielded results so like find ones great results okay so uh, and that is the, the many histories the fact that all these possibilities are done and somehow it, the possibilities are interacting with each other so that um, you have like the straight odds but you also have these weird games you can play with the odds when you look at it this way and uh, that's the whole two slit experiment. And also, by the way, as far as taking Feynman's advice, he he said to understand quantum mechanics, you try to understand the two slit experiment. That that is the epitome of it. That is the weirdness and this the, that's the strange thing. And it, it's macroscopic. You can see there are two slits. That's the issue there. That's just, even that is bringing it up to macroscopic scale, where the screen and everything is human distances. It's just that you cannot understand that thing. It is so weird. But the many histories interpretations at least makes it make sense in one level. And then starts not making sense when you think, how can there be many histories? But again, it doesn't make sense for many histories of human beings, as far as we know. You can kind of make sense of that, too. There's all kinds of weird things with conservation of energy and stuff. So I think, let's just say, it doesn't make sense at the macroscopic level. We could maybe make it make sense. Maybe it'll turn out to make sense. But who knows? But you, like I said in the last video, you don't really need it there. You just need it in a small level to explain what's happening in the two-slit experiment. That, yeah, the, in that kind of case, if you don't disturb the system, uh, both possibilities happen and they interact with each other, actually, because they both happen when you have a, a wave thing. It's sort of an n-dimensional. Which brings me to this whole queer than we can suppose. I do believe the universe is incomprehensible. I think use a mathematical metaphor for my, you know, personal and current and pretty long-standing belief, which is that, um, you know, that it's infinitely dimensional and multivariate. And what our passes for understanding is always some finite dimensional cross-section of that. Okay, anytime you take a measurement of a temperature, of a distance, anything, you're basically taking a, a, some sub-dimension, you know, some finite dimensional cross-section, you know, and a spatial cross-section, so it's limited, it's an interval even, so it's not a cross-section of, of an infinite extent, it's a, you know, a cross-section taking, you know, it's like a cross-section of a shape, not of a, a whole plane's worth of cross-section, but just a little square's worth of a cross-section. So it's all these little stamp cross-sections. And um, <clears throat> you can increase your understanding because you can get a higher and higher dimensional cross-section, Plus, you get better, you know, the taking of the cross-sections, the taking data is not perfect, so you get better and better at how you do that. And this is how our understanding is increasing. And so, in the interest of humility, of course, you can say that compared to the infinite knowledge, uh, you're all the, the knowledge you do have is, is the same as zero, right? If you're making that comparison, um, it's the kind of estimate scientists would make all the time where that is negligible. I mean, the knowledge you have is negligible compared to the knowledge you don't have, always. And it always will be for all time. That's what I believe as a skeptic. And that, that's an article of faith, by the way. I'm not saying I can demonstrate that per se, um, or I certainly can't prove it. But I think you know, my experiences have demonstrate the reliability of that premise to me. Okay. Anyway, it's what I believe. So, um, uh, so when you're, um, you know, if you want to compare that way, you've got a negligible. But why would you compare that way? Why would you compare the unknown that you don't even know? I mean, it's, it's almost ludicrous, or the idea that you get sort of a, a, a humbling answer it should not be that it, surprising you're comparing to this infinite amount of unknown and that as a skeptic believe. Um, would be, or will be, or will exist, or does exist, or waiting to be discovered. Because the thing is, is 
that's not the only comparison. I can also compare what I know now to what I knew last year, ten years ago, what I as a, you know, the current uh, generation of my species uh, know compared to previous generations. And that's increasing. Okay, it's not negligible compared to that. To that, there is a small incremental improvement that's pretty evident over time. And so that's what, uh, that's, that's what understanding is. Um, so it's always insignificant compared to all possible understanding. But that's also a strange abstraction. And compared to actual understanding, it's never uh, changing a set, and I would say increasing. Now, um, increasing is a funny thing, because you want to count all the knowledge that's wrong. Yes, I'm counting all the knowledge that's wrong, because all knowledge has some errors to it, so of course I'm counting that kind of knowledge. You could say that <coughs> someone would learn more and more knowledge that's so bad that they're not really getting more knowledge. These start to be word games, right? <coughs> now, we can discuss whether you can really refine your knowledge, and yes, you can. You just have to come up with a criteria that you can then use and measure against. And, you know, the issue there is not can you do that. The issue is <coughs> how many different subjects of interest to mankind can you do that with. Because you can definitely do that in physics, but will you ever explain love that way? I am one that believes that you will. That <coughs> with, you know, we've explained the brain a lot already with classical physics. Um, I believe we'll start explaining it too with relativity and quantum mechanics. Because I expect that those laws of physics have had an influence on our brains. Because why wouldn't they? Our brains do things at the quantum scale. Maybe not so much relativity, actually. But, um, but just in principle. But quantum scale, that, that's what runs the world of chemistry. You know, it's not like doesn't affect biochemistry. They like to say it doesn't affect our level, and I was even saying maybe it doesn't. It definitely affects biochemistry. So the way the brain works is going to use that. I don't think it's not a silver bullet. It's just not the god of the gaps for willpower. I'm not saying quantum mechanics explains our will or the fact that we're these intentional phenomena. Uh, I'm just saying that the, I think that all the laws of physics have to be taken into account. And... Uh, you know, doing that is the same as evolution, you know, quote-unquote, exploiting those laws of physics. We use it where we can use it and try to mitigate the, the problems of it where there would be problems. So, anyway, thank you very much. Very interesting, uh, interesting response and subject. Cheers.